So obviously I shall, uh, I shall focus my presentation on uh, Europe's contribution, uh, but I shall uh, certainly make more general remarks uh, uh, about the space station itself. So as you can see, this is an interesting picture because it's not anymore the configuration of the space station today because uh, the ATV that you can see uh, at the bottom of this uh, uh, picture is not there anymore, is back to Earth uh, since uh, this afternoon. What is the Europe's participation? Because as um, David Williams said this afternoon, uh, I am just the Director General of ESA and uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have to speak on behalf of uh, my member states. And uh, to say that uh, 10 member states of ESA are contributing to the International Space Station not uh, the 17 uh, ones, by the way, when uh, the decision has been taken to contribute to the International Space Station, there were only uh, 13 member states at that time uh, in ESA. So uh, 10 member states are uh, representing the e Europe's contribution to the International Space Station. So you have the list there. Obviously, among these member states, uh, uh, clearly the biggest contributor is uh, Germany, and I must say that uh, Germany has has been always the, the leader of, uh, of that uh, Europe's participation to the International Space Station, and, and it's never very easy to be a leader. And I must say that uh, we owe uh, uh, to Germany the fact that uh, uh, Europe has been a very reliable partner to the International Space Station. Italy is uh, the second uh, contributor to uh, to the Europe's contribution to the International Space Station. And again, Italy is contributing not only through ESA, but also through a national program. And I shall come back uh, to that. And then France is, uh, is also an important contributor. But as usual, uh, the, the importance of member states as ESA is not measured only through uh, contributions. Uh, so this is the 10 member states contributing to the Europe's participation to, uh, uh, to the International Space Station. And uh, uh, let's say in 10 years with 10 member states, I can tell you that I have lived a lot of change in governments, and, uh, meaning that uh, the space station is so important in Europe that uh, the change in government, they have not changed the willingness of these governments to contribute to the International Space Station, which is certainly a good sign for uh, the International Space Station. And as I said, for 10 years we have been, uh, we have been uh, uh, a partner in, on ground, and uh, since uh, February of this year, we are a partner in, uh, in space. You have in this chart the last 10 years, which have started by uh, uh, an intergovernmental agreement uh, which was signed on the, the 29th of January 1998, and the first launch, the first element of the space station has been launched on the 20th of November 1998, and it was uh, a Russian-built Zarya module, which was launched uh, almost uh, 10 years ago. The station is permanently inhabited uh, since October 2000, and the assembly is scheduled for completion in 2010. So this is the, uh, the official uh, milestones of the, uh, of the International Space Station. But I would like to, to recall that the International Space Station has, has a much longer history than the last 10 years. And we should not forget from where we are coming. And especially I was told that I was uh, uh, on the space station. I was working on the space station more than 20 years ago, so it's uh, much uh, uh, longer than these uh, 10 years. And uh, I must say that the, in the history of the International Space Station is uh, almost 25 years uh, back. Uh, and at that time, there were two projects in the world, the so-called Space Station Freedom on uh, the western side and Mir 2 on the eastern side. And I just arrived at ESA in 86 uh, in charge of the utilization of the space station. And I must say that it was not uh, uh, a long time after that I was working directly with John David Bartu on the utilization of the space station. And at that time we were, uh, let's say, selling the space station to the users. 
So all that was uh, uh, going uh, well up to the beginning of the 90s. And at the beginning of the 90s, the iron wall fell down on ground. And I must say that it fell down in space also. And this is from that point that the, the two projects, Space Station Freedom and Mir 2, were merged. And this is the reason why what we are celebrating today, it's uh, less than the space station, I would say, uh, but much more the international aspect of the space station. What is important in the space station is the international aspect of that space station, meaning that uh, we had to learn to work together. And I can tell you that at the beginning, to, uh, uh, it was not already very easy to work on the space station freedom. Uh, I remember a lot of discussions, for example, on the international standard rack. I can tell you that uh, it was a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions on what could be the international standard rack on board the space station. But when the Russians arrived, I must say that it made, it made the discussions even, even more difficult. So we had to learn, and we learned a lot. And uh, after that, we had to trust each other. And trust, you cannot buy trust. You cannot sign a check and someone uh, is trusting you. Uh, this is something that you build up step by step, and uh, this was uh, certainly a difficult process. And this took some years from the beginning of the 90s up to 98. Uh, just to say that the Columbus program has been decided several times. Uh, I cannot tell you that there were one decision of Columbus. Columbus was decided in uh, 85, in 87, uh, in 93, and in 95. So, uh, uh, so meaning that each time we had to go back to the member states to ask for a new decisions, a new decision in a di different environment. And this is the reason why today the most important asset of the space station is the partnership. And that I am just quoting uh, Mike Griffin. Uh, Mike Griffin always said that the, uh, the most important asset of the space station is the partnership. And this is a very solid partnership because it's a partnership which has been built up through a lot of difficulties, a lot of programmatic difficulties, including budget, budget difficulties, uh, a lot of technical difficulties, and also a tragedy, tragedy with the uh, loss of Colombia. And the loss of Colombia was not the NASA tragedy, it was a tragedy of the partnership. So the partnership has become stronger and stronger through the difficulties, meaning that today this is a very solid and a very strong uh, partnership. And a lot has been done. I told you almost eight years to start the process of the International Space Station. But after that, look at what has been achieved in 10 years. After that, the time was accelerating and in spite, again, of the Columbia tra tragedy. So uh, it was 28 shuttle flights, 16 Soyuz crew flights, 30 Progress flights, 1 ATV. Now we can say that uh, uh, we have a full mission of the ATV. Uh, 700 hours of uh, uh, external vehicle uh, activities. and. Uh, 18 major elements added to the original Zarya module. And uh, you have here the list of uh, all the elements which have been added, be they from the United States, Russia, Japan, Canada, and uh, ESA. None of the member states of ESA could succeed or could reach the success that they could get through ESA if they were alone. So we have to, to learn to work together. It's difficult. This requires a lot of efforts. But there is some recipes to have uh, success. First of all, you must have a common objective. I think that I am a strong believer in the uh, cooperation according to projects. Cooperation per principle does not work. But when you have one project, one common objective, you have some chance to uh, cooperate. 
So it's number one. The number two, you have to have clear rules of the game at the start of the cooperation. You must not change the rules of the game uh, during the cooperation. And this is the reason why, be it the Convention of Visa, be it the Memorandum of, Us of Understanding that we have with uh, uh, international partners, these rules of the games are very important. And uh, we have to respect these rules of the game. Number three, there must be goodwill. Because if each time there is a problem, we are going back to the rules of the game, uh, let's say uh, we are driven by legal aspects. And I must say that sometimes uh, the engineering aspects, uh, they have their also their reality, meaning that uh, there must be some goodwill on uh, each side of the uh, partnership. But the most important part of the recipe is certainly the personal relationship. Uh, institutional relationship do not work if there is not personal relationship, because at the end, this is just men and women from all over the world working together. Starting with the astronauts which are on board the space station, which have to live and work together in a closed environment, and I must say that I, I admire the way they are doing that because sometimes myself, uh, I open the window of my office just to breathe. They cannot even do that you know, on board the space station. But this is not only the astronauts because uh, for uh, three and soon six astronauts uh, in orbit, uh, there is uh, ten, several tens of thousands of persons working on ground for, the, uh, for those uh, crew. And, uh, all these men and women, they have to work together on a daily basis. And I have attended myself some simulations uh, of the ATV operations uh, uh, with three control centers, one in Houston, one in Toulouse, and one in uh, Moscow. And I can tell you that the personal relationship which have been built up through these simulations have been a key in the success of ATV operations. So we have no choice but to succeed in our cooperation and to overcome the difficulties. And this is what we have done on board the space station. This is a fantastic endeavor because we have overcome all our difficulties. We at ESA, we would have never succeeded without our partners. I am celebrating today the, uh, the success of the ATV mission, and I, I am very proud of the ATV. I am very proud of the, such an achievement. But I wish to recall that the ATV success would not have been possible without the cooperation with the United States and with, uh, with Russia. Uh, starting with Russia, the docking, port of, uh, the docking port of the ATV is coming from Russia. And we are docked to a Russian part of the uh, International Space Station. And uh, the, uh, uh, on the NASA side, uh, for the operations, and uh, including for the uh, project review of the ATV, and I always appreciated the fact that uh, Mike Griffin, in person, attended uh, the uh, project review of the ATV, meaning that uh, the ATV is not only an ESA project. This is a project of the partnership, and the success of ESA is the success of the partnership. And I would like to, uh, to thank again uh, our partners for that uh, uh, very important success. So as you can see, the first contribution of uh, ESA to the space station was uh, launched on the 7th of February 2008 with the launch of the Columbus Laboratory. Uh, and you can see here uh, our uh, colleague astronaut uh, Hans Legel uh, uh, outside the uh, Columbus uh, Laboratory during the uh, uh, processing of the Columbus as an integral part of the uh, space station. And I must say that uh, Columbus is uh, a very good laboratory. The start of uh, the utilization of Columbus demonstrates that uh, this is uh, really a, a laboratory that the scientists will, uh, will take benefit of. We had some problems with the, uh, the start of some payloads as any 
payload on a ground-based laboratory. I must say that this is complex payload. So uh, I was not scared to have uh, this type of problem when we have started uh, to, to, you, to, to use the payloads. But now the, the problems are over and the full utilization has started. And I am sure that uh, we shall have a lot of uh, scientific progress uh, coming from uh, Columbus. Just to recall that Columbus is not only our laboratory, it's a laboratory that we are sharing with all partners, and there is as many uh, NASA payloads on board Columbus than uh, we have uh, uh, ESA uh, payloads. So this is a part, an integral part of the International Space Station. This is not an ESA uh, part. Uh, this is just one of the laboratory of the International Space Station. A good one, by the way. And uh, the second contribution, uh, and uh, as I told you, uh, the mission is over uh, since uh, just a couple of hours, is the uh, ATV. And I must say that uh, the, uh, the first ATV, Jules Verne, has uh, fulfilled all its objectives beautifully. I would say beyond my expectations. I can tell you that the day of the launch on the 9th of March in Kourou, I was a little bit nervous. And uh, okay, uh, the launch was okay, and I was already uh, glad at that time. Uh, but we had a lot of uh, successive steps, and I must say that Jules, Jules Verne has uh, fulfilled its mission step by step, uh, fulfilling all the objectives. Uh, including the transfer of fuel on which I was myself uh, a little bit uh, nervous to the point that I was asking my project team uh, to uh, not to take on board uh, the, the Russian fuel, but uh, okay, they have insisted, I was overruled and they were, they were right. Uh, so uh, transfer of fuel to the, to the space station was uh, very good, the transfer of cargo, uh, the reboost of the space station, the, the maneuvers that uh, the ATV has done to, uh, for the space station to, uh, to have collision avoidance with space debris, all that has have worked beautifully. And even I have learned that uh, the astronauts, they, they were using the ATV as a quiet place uh, and that they, uh, they were using uh, the ATV also to take some uh, rest. And uh, I am glad for that. So it's, uh, at least I can say that ATV is a fully manned uh, vehicle because uh, it has been used uh, by uh, uh, some astronauts that as their uh, quarter to live in. And uh, the, uh, the re-entry uh, has uh, been made uh, today. I must say that the two boosts that which were necessary for the re-entry were very accurate, uh, very precise. The re-entry was very precise to the point that uh, the, uh, one of the two NASA aircraft uh, has, uh, could uh, uh, take uh, pictures of the re-entry, meaning that we shall have a lot of data on the re-entry of the ATV. And I can uh, say that uh, the ATV, uh, we know that it has been, uh, it stayed intact down to 80 kilometers of altitude, meaning that the break of the ATV took place at a very low altitude meaning that the, 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 the volume of the debris are limited to a, uh, uh, to a small part of the Pacific Ocean. So now, what shall we do? First of all, we shall use the International Space Station. We have spent so much time, so much difficulties, uh, so much money to build a space station together that now the priority of the priority is to use the space station. And it would be uh, a big mistake, and even I would be ashamed if we were not uh, putting all efforts to take the best benefit of that uh, uh, international space station. And as I said uh, before, uh, this uh, international space station is opening uh, new doors to, to the scientific uh, world. I think that now they have a permanent access to uh, the microgravity world. They have a permanent access to low Earth orbit. And uh, I am convinced that uh, to have a permanent access to such a laboratory will uh, be followed by a lot of scientific progress. But for that, we need time. 
I cannot tell you tomorrow which are the scientific progress that we shall make. But I am deeply convinced that opening that new door to the scientific community will lead to a lot of progress. And uh, so the next rendezvous will be in 10 years from now, and it will not be anymore celebrating the International Space Station. It will be celebrating the scientific result of the International Space Station. And I give you a, a rendezvous for that uh, because I am convinced that there will be a lot of results and a lot of results which will be useful for improving the quality of life on Earth. And uh, I think that uh, based on the space station success, we shall start exploring the solar system on a very solid uh, basis. And I think that uh, the International Space Station has brought that th this new feature, which is the International Cooperation for Exploration, meaning that the moon now will be the endeavor of uh, all nations which want to join this uh, exploration uh, venture and starting with a partnership that we have built up through the space station. And, uh, and this is where I am confident that the exploration will be a successful endeavor. And it's not a question of date. I was asked the, uh, this afternoon, okay, 2020 for, for the moon. Okay, if it's 2022, it will not be so, uh, so different. The, the, the most important aspect is that we shall go there together on the moon and Mars. And this is not moon or Mars, this is both. Both are important. Uh, and this is just a question of time. And this is the reason why it's time now that I am giving you what I feel are the lessons learned from uh, the International Space Station, because after 10 years of the space station, and as I said, even uh, maybe uh, 20 years, which are the lessons learned? I have uh, five lessons learned. First of all, we have to avoid single point failure. Clearly, we have to establish some redundancies for the uh, next pro international programs. And uh, because uh, we have been demonstrated that uh, when we have a single point failure, and for example, the the space shuttle was a single point failure, meaning that when the space shuttle was grounded, we were all grounded, except the Russians. And I must say, thanks to the Russians, we could uh, continue uh, uh, access to the space station. But at least all the uh, uh, parts which were due to be launched by the space shuttle were grounded at the same time, meaning that clearly we have to review together which are the possible single point failure and to see which are the redundancies that we have to bring into an exploration program to make it more robust and more resistant to uh, any problem that we shall meet anyway uh, during the exploration programs. The second, second lesson learned, and I was mentioning that when I was uh, saying that with John David 20 years ago we were selling the space station to users. Uh, it was much too long for the users. Uh, let's say the users that we were working with, with John David uh, 20 years ago, they are retired. Meaning that it was an investment uh, which was certainly interesting, but not directly applicable to the space station. And this is certainly one of the important lessons learned, meaning that uh, for the future, we have to make sure that we shall associate the users much earlier in the uh, development of new uh, facilities. I know that this is not so easy, and there was a lot of discussions among the partners. Shall we first complete the space station and then start the utilization, or shall we start the utilization as early as possible during the assembly sequence? And the answer at that time was, let's let's do the first, the assembly sequence. But because it was already too long and it was not designed to have the utilization as early as possible in the development. But this is something that I would like to, uh, to discuss with the partners is how can we associate the users much earlier in the development of uh, new uh, international programs. The third lesson learned is associating the public also. 
we have not enough associated the public to the, to the International Space Station. And uh, uh, it's not so easy to associate, uh, to, to associate all citizens. But today, clearly, uh, it's difficult to explain uh, to the citizens uh, that they are part of the International Space Station. For most of the citizens, is something for the scientists, something for the engineers, something for the politicians, and not something for them. And this is certainly something that we are missing. It's uh, how can we do better? And especially the exploration program is something that we have to do with the public, with each citizen. They must feel involved in that exploration program. Because if not, I am afraid that it will not be a solid exploration program. And this is my fourth lesson to learn. To associate the public, the, the best ambassadors are certainly the astronauts. The astronauts are certainly the best ambassadors that we can have vis-à-vis -vis the public. And it's what I said many times when you have introduced me, you said that uh, I tried to be an astronaut and uh, at the end, since I could not be an astronaut, I just became DG. Uh, but this is true. Uh, when I am on a podium with an astronaut, nobody cares about the director general. They are all looking for the astronauts, meaning that just to say that DG is just a backup uh, solution. Uh, and this is, this is normal. I am not taking that as uh, <laughs> something against the director generals or uh, the directors. This is normal. And this is very attractive to be an astronaut. And I can give you statistics. At the same time, I have opened five posts of directors in ESA, 80 applicants, and four positions of astronauts, 8,000 applicants. Meaning that uh, it's uh, 100 times more attractive to be an astronaut than to be a director. But this is what I have told my colleagues who are candidates to become an astronaut. If you are not becoming an astronaut, don't worry, you have a backup solution, you can become director general. So it's, uh... And the last is it was too long for users the space station. But it was even much longer for the young generation. And I must say that arriving at ESA in 86 when you were an, a young engineer and waiting for more than 20 years to see uh, Columbus becoming a reality, it was much too long. And it's not so easy to attract the young talents with programs which are for 20 years from now. But it means that we have to define milestones which are challenging enough in the short term to attract the young generation, because we need the young talents. We need even the best talents, because space will stay forever a very risky business, especially in terms of technical activities. We are taking a lot of risk, and the only way to manage the risk is to have the best talents. And this is certainly the duty of all the directors of the world, it's to, to make and to organize programs with challenging short-term uh, milestones which would attract all the young generations that I even met uh, this afternoon. So let's work together for the, for the young generation. Thank you very much.